Hello, everybody, and welcome. Uh, hope you're all well. This is the uh, Decipher webinar, um, and thank you for joining us today. We have 85 registered for this event, uh, and the event is uh, about expert witnesses in construction, why pay for a point of view. Uh, my name is Paul Gibbons, and I am the founding director and chief executive of Decipher. On the webinar today, uh, we have four speakers uh, looking at impartiality and conflicts of interest, the role of the experts and how do people manage risks of multiple clients and projects. And we have uh, another speaker talking about supporting experts in their role and the practical perspectives. And I'm also pleased to be joined uh, by a couple of lawyers and, and a barrister, uh, why experts are needed and their duties and appointing experts. And then finally, we're going to be discussing the benefits of experts in hearings and adjudications. And we may well hear one or two war stories. At the end of the session, there'll be a panel discussion uh, that I'll be facilitating. And we would welcome any questions you may have. So please put them in the chat or in the Q&A uh, and we've, we will facilitate those accordingly. So today, I'm joined on the panel uh, with, uh, by Rupert Lacker, who's a partner at Charles Russell Speechless. Thank you, Rupert, for joining us. Uh, Rupert is a highly experienced construction lawyer. She has advised on the drafting and negotiation of building contracts and consultants' appointments, and now specializes in project advisory work, as well as dispute resolution, including mediation, adjudication, and litigation. Rupert regularly acts for all parts of the supply chain, from major developers to consultants to, to subcontractors. I'm also joined on the panel with my co-director, Bill Bordill, who's a quantum expert and adjudicator at Decipher. Bill has an is an experienced quantum expert and dispute resolver. He brings industry insight gained over three decades in senior positions with both contract and consultant organizations. Bill is the discipline lead for our quantum surveying function within Decipher, and combined with his role and combines us with his role as an APC assessor for the RICS. Bill maintains a direct and active involvement in current issues on live projects and has over 35 years of experience in the construction industry. I'm also pleased to be joined today with uh, Helena White, a barrister at Hartwick Chambers. Helena is an, an insurance and commercial practitioner with a particular focus on construction and engineering disputes, professional negligence and property damage. As well as being a robust trial advocate, Helena is known for providing clear and accessible advice, either in writing or in conference. She is regularly instructed by a range of clients, including employers, contractors, and construction professionals, insurers, and insolvency practitioners to act in litigation, both in the TCC and the county courts. And she also has experience in arbitration, adjudication, and mediation. And finally, but by no means least, I'm also pleased to be joined by one of our senior quantum surveyors, Andrew Norton. Andrew has over 18 years experience in a wide range of roles working within the building and civil engineering industry. He has worked as an estimator, contract administrator, and quantity surveyor, both contractor and the employer, and provides assistance to experts within Decipher. Andrew has worked on a wide range of commissions, including adjudication, arbitration, assistance and mega project contract administration. So without further ado, uh, I will now hand over to Bill to kick us off to talk about impartiality and conflicts of interest, the role of the experts and how do people manage risks of multiple clients and projects. Thank you, Bill. Okay, thank you, Paul. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, if we could just have the slides. Right. Thank you, Annie. So I no need to say any more about myself. I've asked, been asked to prepare a short presentation on conflicts of interest and the preparation of um, expert evidence. Um, the main themes of my talk are going to be what you see in front of you. So this is evidence, obligations, conflicts, practical steps that hopefully will be helpful, um, considerations for preparing a report, and then I'm going to summarize all the key takeaways from the presentation at the end. Next slide, please, Annie. Thank okay. you. 
So witness evidence, there's essentially two types of evidence that we, we're going to consider, and that's factual based evidence and opinion based evidence. Virtually anybody can give fact based evidence, so long as they're above a certain age and of sound mind and actually saw something relevant and are prepared to write a witness statement to that effect. But only qualified and experienced people may give expert evidence. Now, in the expert role, basically there are two sides to the fence. One acts either as a party representative or as an independent expert. A party representative would be partisan and advocating the position of one of the parties, whereas the independent expert really should be basically representing the court. He is there to assist the court and present a balanced view of what happened and, in his opinion, um, what the outcome or, or, or his interpretation from his experience and qualifications of the situations that occurred. If we go to the next slide, please, Annie. Bill, just a quick one. There's a, we've got some uh, voice clarity. Uh, some people can't hear it very, very clearly. Uh, maybe you can just come a bit closer to, this, to your um, mouthpiece. Okay. There's, uh, I must apologise, there's an echo in this room. It's all hard surfaces, so um, I don't know, is that any clearer? If I find it clearer, it's a bit better for yes. Okay. So the obligations of the expert come from what you see in front of you. Oh, no, we need to go back, Annie. Thank you. That's it, excellent. So governed by the Civil Procedure Rule 35, actually the expert has to comply with all the Civil Procedure Rules, but 35 is the one concerned with what we can, we're talking about here. And it's, it's about the overriding duty to serve the court. Um, the expert is also to comply with Practice Direction 35, and I've highlighted in bold the relevant extract from that, which is independent, uninfluenced, assist the court, be objective, provide an unbiased opinion on all matters within their expertise. So it's quite clear that the, the, the expert has to provide assistance and support to the court, and he has to act only within the remit of his expertise and experience. Okay, next slide, please, Annie. So it's enshrined in the, in the civil procedure rules, but it's also in case law, with the case of Campania Naviera SA versus the Prudential Assurance Company. Now that is more popularly known as the Icarian Reefer, and that's a reference to a sailing vessel, I believe, and not necessarily something that one might smoke. But what came out of this case was several, several um, edicts for experts to follow, and the one that's relevant to us is that the expert must provide independent, objective, and unbiased assistance to the court. So we've seen it in the CPR uh, rules, and we've seen it in case law. So that's fairly strong of what the what the expert, how the expert should behave. If we could go to the next slide, Annie, please. So conflicts of interest. There's lots of information about conflicts of interest, lots of information that, that people can gain. And, and the RICS has actually produced uh, a number of different guides, and they're mandatory for RICS members to follow. But to cut all that down into one sentence, a conflict of interest is any involvement that raises justifiable doubts concerning the impartiality of the expert. Any involvement. So there are three types of bias to consider principally. There's actual, unconscious, and the perception of bias. Um, actual bias is easy to identify. Unconscious bias is, is more difficult, and there's the perception of bias, where there may be no bias at all, but an innocent uh, bystander might consider that there, there is some bias, and that would affect the weight that the court would apply to the expert opinion evidence provided. So if we could go to the next slide, please, Annie. So we have some practical steps to avoid conflicts. The very first one is to carry out a conflict check. Now, within Decipher, we have a, a very strong database of all of our projects, all of our clients, and also key relevant staff within those clients. 
So it's very easy for us to do a robust conflict check and quite quickly. Um, we only currently have three experts operating within the business, so it's very easy for us to conduct that sort of check. Um, we don't suffer the problems that some of our larger competitors uh, suffer from, where it's very difficult for them to conduct a robust conflict check, where they have maybe a thousand experts working for them. And we'll see why that causes a problem later on. Now, in the RICS guides that I referred to earlier, one of them talks about a traffic light system, which came about from the International Bar Association. And this gives real good guidance on what is a red light, an orange light, and a green light. And clearly, a, a green light would be good to go. An orange light, it would depend on the circumstances. And a red light is, a, is an absolute no. So if I just give you an instance of what they may be, um, a red light would be if an expert holds a financial or controlling interest in one of the parties. Uh, an orange light, sticking with the same theme, may be if the expert held a past financial or controlling interest. And I guess it would depend on how far in the past that controlling interest was. And sticking with the theme again, a green light would be if the expert held an insignificant number of shares in one of the parties, that would be acceptable. So for instance, if an expert held 20 pounds worth of shares in Virgin Media, he's unlikely to be biased in his, in his opinions or even be seen to be biased because he stands to gain no financial gain out of it. Okay, thank you, Annie. If we could go to the next slide. So the preparation for the report. Every expert must realize that the, 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 the importance of his report and the strength of his report is not just his opinion, it's the reasoning behind his opinion. So he must understand all of his instructions and stick within his instruction. He must analyze all of the facts and he must challenge the factual information that he's been presented. Generally, he will be presented with a one-sided case. And it's up, to, it's up to the expert to actually make sure that he gets enough information for him to give a truly independent, balanced report to the court. Otherwise, how can the court um, take cognizance of his uh, opinion? And finally, the expert really must consider what will be the most helpful to the tribunal. So if he feels that the information is incomplete, or even if he feels his instructions are not necessarily helpful to the court, he must challenge his instructions. He must never act outside of his instructions, but he has to keep at the back of his mind his overriding duty to the court. Okay. If we could go to the next slide, please. So I'm now approaching the end and I want, to, I want to just recap of the key takeaways. We've got CPR 35 and case law, which firmly establishes the overriding duty of the expert to the court, and that is independent, objective, unbiased, and to provide assistance. And that is tied up in the case law from the Icarian Reefer. We have the conflict checks, we have the traffic light system to guide people with their conflict checks. And the same report is a memory jogger for me because I always like to think, I always like to read through my reports and just check that would I have written the same report if I had been working for the other side? And if the answer is no, then I will go back through my report and reconsider my conclusions because to be truly independent, you must be able to put your hand on your heart and say that you would have written the same report regardless of who is your paymaster. And with that, I'd like to go to the last slide, Annie. And simply say thank you for listening. Thank you, Bill. Um, I appreciate it's a short space of time uh, and there's a lot to pack in there. Um, but hopefully uh, people have seen the, uh, the message that's come across in terms of uh, maintaining that, there's, that, you, that you're impartial and no conflict. Uh, so that was very useful. Thank you for that. Okay, so Andrew in uh, Andrew Norton in to uh, uh, discuss uh, supporting uh, us as experts in decipher in our role uh, and the practical perspectives um, from his view. So Andrew, over to you, please.
Hi, yeah, I'm uh, Andrew Norton, a senior um, quantity surveyor at Decipher. I've been with the company since um, January 2019. It's been flat out since I've got here, working predominantly on dispute resolution. I've got about 13, approximately 13 years experience now working in dispute resolution, as I worked for 11 years previously with uh, Knowles working in um, claims and dispute resolution. If we go to the next slide, please, Annie. I have over 10 years working specifically with experts um, in various disputes, dis dispute types, so international arbitration, litigation, adjudication on various different projects on a mixed selection of contract types. My first um, experience of working with an expert was in the UAE on an airport scheme. It was a final account dispute and there was a large team of about 20 of us and we were looking at um, about 10 variations each and my first uh, meeting with the expert I'd only been there a few days and I got grilled about um, grilled about uh, some acronyms and some details on some of the work that I was doing and I hadn't actually at this point got round to reviewing some of these variations and one of the questions he asked me was what is the BHS area and at this point, I hadn't looked at this variation and I'd just worked on some hotel jobs and I was basically, the first response was back of house service area and knowing from his look straight away, I realised I'd made a big blooper. And from that point on, I realised that you need to be on the ball with your acronyms, your definitions, read, your, read the contracts and you need to be well prepared for any time that you're assisting or that you're meeting an expert. So, um, in next slide, please, Annick. So, what are the usual requirements when assisting an expert? You will be asked to provide, to collate information, review information, present information, and then pull together the appendices. The information will typically be timesheets or site data entry, uh, drawings, correspondence, classification, carry out measurements, assessment of rates. Once you've got a bit of experience and you've worked with a, um, an expert before or you've worked with one of his colleagues or you've been referred by a colleague, they will, the expert will trust you to do more um, um, further responsibility in the work, you'll start analysing the data, you'll start running the quantum calculations and provide step-by-step -step descriptions of the quantum process to the expert. Um, so the next, next, date, uh, next slide please. So typically, um, well, historically, you would, have pro you would have been provided all your information in hard copies. That now is probably something in the past where you'll get most of the information provided by uh, WeTransfer or Dropbox. Hard copies of files are usually difficult to, to carry out searches in to find the information, but they do have benefits when they're there in front of you. And you can you can see what the documents are and where you are, and you can rearrange them into your own your own uh, preferred method. There seems to be a lot of um, countless amounts now of these web-based platforms for information, such as CMAR, which would be used on the NEC or Raconex. These um, are quite good at if, if they're used correctly, but when it comes to going through the information, it can be really time-consuming to find any uh, specific information. So there are positives and negatives to that, but for me, it seems to take twice as long to find any particular letter or piece of correspondence than if you had a, um, a, a traditional filing system. And then there's the, the, the worst case scenario for, for me is the uh, email dump when you get a, a pen drive and there's 2000 mm -hmm. emails on there and basically you're told everything you need is here. Uh, it can lead to lots of unproductive time but you can actually undiscover some information that otherwise you wouldn't have found. So there are some benefits to that as well. So understanding what is missing and requesting information. So often you may find that there is a letter referenced in a document or a letter clearly missing or some information missing. What I would recommend is when you ask for a document, you ask for any documents listed within the document as well. So. I learned that one the hard way as well. So you basically ask for a letter, the letter turns up, it's referencing another letter. You ask for that letter, that's referencing two other letters. So you keep on, on and on and on to finally get to the letter that you needed uh, and sometimes pass by in that period. 
whenever you're asking for um, any documents as well, ask for a full set of them. So you may be required to get one monthly uh, progress report, uh, one valuation, etc. Ask for all of them. Ask for a full set because um, you, you're going to need it at some point down the line anyway. And also, if um, a particular page of a report is is asked for, ask for the full document. Don't ask for a part of a document because you'll miss the um, the full context of the document might be missed on one page or in one paragraph. So if you have a full set that will provide you with what, um, the full details and the full picture of what's happened. With regards to asking for information, never put ASAP on a request for an RFI and that goes for any, whether that's working with an export or working in general in the industry, in construction industry when asking for information because that seems to have the opposite effect. You don't seem to get a response at all when you do that. If you put a firm date and also a reasonable date if you put an unreasonable date in for a return, it won't be met and that just causes an issue. Um, also, keep, um, keep a tracker of your information. Uh, make it simple. It doesn't need to be 20 columns um, wide. Just a simple tracker to ask when you ask for something, who you ask for, and something that everyone can add to. And uh, Next slide, please, Annie. So, as Bill touched on, impartiality um, and conflict, it's important that the uh, assistant also carries out, or they carry out a conflict check on the assistants, because you don't know where they've previously worked, who they've previously worked with, so it's important that that's carried out as well. Um, it is the, uh, the expert's duty to provide independent impartial evidence, so therefore, the assistant has to work in the same manner. If the expert, expert asks you to do something, do not make assumptions of what they want, do what they ask. If you're unsure, you ask again because they've asked you to do something for a reason. If you think that maybe something should be done in another way, don't do that. Ask them, get it clarified and do what they say because you could uh, affect the impartiality if you carry something out in a way that's not being asked or you're simply just wasting time, theirs and yours. Uh, structure, structures of a report seem to, of an expert report, um, experts have different styles, but generally they will follow some guidance rules, which will have exec summary, introduction, um, facts, issues, and then the analysis. Typically, the assistant will help with the analysis and the appendices. They won't really get involved in the opinion, or they shouldn't really, unless um, directed otherwise, or they're comfortable to do so, but really they should be sticking to just assisting with the analysis, the quantum, etc. And time management. Um, expect tight deadlines, expect long hours when information's um, late coming through. Could be prepared to work a lot of evenings, a lot of weekends. And then finally, if um, when you're pulling together a document for an, for an expert, whatever time you put aside for putting together the appendices, double it because preparing the files, printing the quantum, all the referencing for the appendices takes far longer than you can ever imagine. So it just, if you want it to be right, you've got to give yourself plenty of time. So uh, final slide, please. I mean, that's just, um, that's it for me. So thanks a lot for listening. Super, thank you, Andrew. Uh, some really uh, good points there in terms of the support that you uh, provide to us as experts and the experience. And thank you for sharing that with us. Um, so good, okay. Um, so now I'm going to move on to uh, Rupa, uh, uh, and Rupa, um, questions for you really, um, why are experts needed in your view, um, what are their duties and obviously what advice can you give regarding appointing experts please? Okay, thank you very much, good morning everybody. Andrew, I have to say before I started is um, I'm in the middle of a couple of adjudications at the moment where we've got no less than three submissions due this week. Um, so it's fun and games and when you said you know the tip about doubling the length of time you need for cross-referencing and adding appendices I just thought yeah that's exactly right so if you don't remember anything else from my talk um, certainly take away Andrew's takeaway because that is absolutely essential. Um, thank you very much for the introduction so um, I'm going to talk about why experts are needed um, where I think personally um, experts can provide value, benefits of having an expert quite early on, 
what is it that I look for when appointing an expert, how I would go about formally instructing an expert, and then a couple of examples um, and war stories, which is always fun. Um, Bill has already mentioned um, that ultimately experts are required in order to independently assist the court or a tribunal to come to a view in relation to a particular technical issue. And that's absolutely right. That is very much for me looking at the end objective and when a client comes to talk to you about a particular problem that they have on a project, then that's where you're looking at the end goal. But that can be quite far down the line. For example, if you're issuing a claim in the TCC, then from the point of issuing the claim up to getting to trial, you could talk about a period of 12 months or 18 months obviously in adjudication or other forms of dispute resolution, it's a shorter period. So my only point of that is often it can feel like the role of the expert and where they come in is very far down the line. And actually, that's not the case at all. Their input and their value is absolutely fundamental very early on in the process. Because when the client comes to you and said, look, you know, I've got this difficulty with this bridge. I don't know what's going on. Um, this is what I think I've been working on the project. You know, here we are. Well, actually, I'm a construction lawyer. I wouldn't be able to tell you exactly what's wrong with the bridge. You would need technical advice to assist in that process. The sooner you have an expert on board, the better, because the expert's role at the beginning is to help fact finding, help with that due diligence, assist all parties from evaluating the claim and as i've mentioned and that actually is exactly what happened we had a problem with a bridge over a railway and in that instance you had a traditional form of procurement where different parties had different responsibilities and we needed various experts to come in and say right what's going on here what's the nature of the problem what's the extent of the problem is there a defect or is it just wear and tear? If it's a defect, what type of defect is it? Is it one of design? Is it one of workmanship? What caused it? We need different expert evidence to help produce the answers to all of those questions. And once we have that, I can then use that in my role as a solicitor to look at the liability under the contract or any other legal position to say, right, if that's all the fact finding, that helps inform me to look at the overall strategy, where do we go from here, what is feasible for the client. Um, and that can, you know, we've talked in the role of there being a problem, but actually that same process can be hugely beneficial when you're not in dispute resolution, when you're just looking at troubleshooting or dispute avoidance. In the current climate, especially, we have found that clients generally you want to keep your project going you don't want to be caught up spending lots of time lots of resource and holding up the project by getting into protracted forms of dispute resolution you want to find a solution and actually working with lawyers working with experts quite early on can help assist that process it's very much a collaborative effort um, you know in fact we're working on um, a project with Decipher at the moment where we're acting for a main contractor. It's on a particular project and the main contractor had submitted an extension of time claim which wasn't awarded by the client. So we needed to look at the claim, how it was presented, how we could better evidence it and support the client in resubmitting the claim, which we've done. So Decipher had carried out an independent delay analysis and said, actually, look, we needed to be sure. What did actually cause critical delay on the project? Are we, are we sure in our position as to the fact that actually we are entitled to an extension of time? Should we looking, be looking at other things? So by carrying out that review, we were able to provide better particulars in relation to supporting the extension of time claim and submit that up the line. It also helps by getting involved at that stage of the process to say, actually, if the client could need some assistance in terms of how it manages its records, how it's looking at its programming, what assistance can we provide in that regard? 
all of that is done through having appointed the expert having appointed us and that's even before you're talking about dispute resolution so that's a completely different angle but shows where true value can be obtained um, having said all of that what is it that i look for when appointing an expert it sounds very very obvious but do they have the suitable qualifications you will find that actually when you you know the construction industry it's very wide and there are loads of technical issues that you can cover. So when you're trying to think about actually a particular type of cladding or what the problem is, does the expert that you're looking at have the specific experience and qualification that you need for this particular project? So be really clear that they can actually answer the questions that you will be asking. Um, do they have the relevant experience in the various forms of dispute resolution? Because whilst you might have early engagement, ultimately, do they have the experience to get you to the end goal that you might want to achieve? Um, a big one for me, and I think Andrew's touched on this, do they love detail? Because construction projects, very document heavy, even if it's electronic or in hard copy, the detail is extensive. If you're having a final account dispute, and you've got to turn that around for an adjudication, you've got to get on top of that final account in a very short period of time. Can they get stuck in and go through all the documents and be happy to do that so that they can truly get to that robust opinion, having assessed all of the facts? Because if they don't love the detail, it's going to be quite difficult to get there, and there is a risk that they could just become the client's mouthpiece, which will be heavily criticised, and will not do you any favours. Um, another big one, because good experts uh, are quite difficult to come across. Do they have the capacity to take on your, your, your instruction? It's very easy to say, look, love to help, come on, let's do it. But actually, can they then adhere to the timescales that are required in order to get um, the advice that you need to your client? If we're working, as I said, in an adjudication, you've got seven days to turn your response around can your expert realistically get you their opinion in two or three days so you can use that um, you can use that advice to form your own submission so you've, you've got to be able to have that collaborative teamwork between the two of you can you work together in that way and i think the next few are the most important for me if we're talking again about a complex form of delay analysis or defects on a bridge, you know, that's quite technical. I know that sounds obvious, but you know, I'm not an engineer. I read English literature and then I studied law. So I can't always get on top of, I, I won't know if I'm looking at a, a, a report, what that actually means. Does the expert have the communication skills to make me feel like I have become the expert, that I could suddenly write a book about delay analysis. Do I feel like I could tell you about structural forces on the bridge? And for me, that also means, do they have patience? Because I'm going to require them to tell me that time and time again, until I'm on top of the detail, so I can be the appropriate advocate that I need to be for my client. Um, and then finally, is my expert not only a technical expert, but do they have a commercial outlook? This is absolutely vital because again, and I come back to it, dispute resolution and when you ultimately get there, sometimes it is unavoidable. But more and more nowadays, we are seeing that clients want solid, robust commercial advice. They need to understand the technical position. They need to understand the legal position but how does that sit within the commercial context of their, you know, their strategy and their outlook? You need an expert that can understand where the client is coming from in that regard. Uh, and, and that for me is absolutely key. All of which I appreciate sounds like common sense um, and stuff that you would be able to find. But um, my dad always used to say, common sense is very uncommon in common people. So it's difficult to find. And if you can get all of that, then you're onto a winner. How would I go about formally instructing an expert? Well, 
get them involved quite early on, but you also need to have a suitable retainer in place. Um, a, a letter, I go about instructing them through your solicitors so that you anything that the expert produces is covered by privilege, that is very important. What you don't want to have is a situation where you instruct an expert to provide an opinion, it's not the opinion that you want, and then that document becomes disclosable in future proceedings. Um, the retainer letter would generally set out all the back, relevant background, the duties of the expert, how we deal with fees, and I would give as much detail and context as possible. I would then have a separate letter which tried to set out the scope of the expert's instructions. Um, and again, it's quite important to keep those two separate and to think about the language that is being used in your letter of instruction and your letter of retainer. I had a case where we had instructed an expert and we had set out the context, the background, and some of the question, the issues that we wanted the expert to think about. It was not exclusively those issues, but it did give some direction. And the case took about three years, um, you know, from initial investigation to ultimately getting to the hearing in the TCC. In that time, I went on maternity leave, I had a baby. When I came back, the hearing was taking place and I thought, wouldn't it be lovely to see the sum of all that work you know, being heard in court with some great QCs and seeing that cross-examination. So I went into the courtroom just at the point that our um, that leading counsel was reading out an extract from my letter of instruction to the expert. And in that judgment, that expert was heavily criticized. Um, so it was a little bit cringeworthy to have my words being read out which would have been fine, but ultimately the expert um, didn't have all the star qualities that I had set out. So really think about the way in which you write the letter of instruction and what's contained therein, because it may be read back out at you in very awkward circumstances. Um, that's a negative experience. So thinking about some of my broader experience, I've been, you know, I've been very lucky. I have worked and I am working, Bill, with some fantastic okay. experts and you know somewhat you know the, the claim about the bridge is a really good example because very early on we got on top of the technical issues i felt like i could tell you about abutments different structural forces operating through the bridge and how all the pieces came together and that was a really effective way of working together in the early stages of the pre-action protocol process because that technical expertise that engagement and getting engaged with the other side's expert as well meant that we were able very effectively to narrow the issues in dispute very early on and all parties could settle effectively and early on which i keep going on about but it's important in the mediation process before we had started proceedings um, another my final tip is one of the things that Bill mentioned is um, if you're reading that report, can you hand on heart say that it would have read the same if it was written for the other side? That's really good. I'm actually going to use that in this, one of my submissions because what, we've, what I've just received is um, a report by a programming expert who says, I'm going to carry out a retrospective form of delay analysis and this is my method. And then when you read the rest of the report, it's a prospective analysis and the output is completely flawed. It's biased, it's unbalanced, and it just doesn't stack up. So there is a prime example, which thankfully it's for the other side, that role of the expert is going to be a war story where I hope um, things don't come good for them. So, you know, really reinforce what Bill and Andrew have said, because from where I am sat, all of that makes complete, complete sense. Um, that's probably all from me. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Ruth. Um, thank you very much indeed for sharing your wisdom and experience. Uh, that's really good knowledge. I have to say that I, I do um, fully support what you're saying there about getting the expert involved early. I was involved in an adjudication just recently, uh, responding to a referral and asked to look at the lead analysis on quantum. I was given 14 days to respond. Yeah. The amount of information that we had 
uh, dealing with a 14 million pound matter uh, just wasn't sufficient time and you know you, you can't expect experts to parachute in we are experts we are not magicians mm -hmm. and you know it's something which you know, we try to uh, ask and advise clients for us to get involved early to give our wisdom and our knowledge and opinion early on um, sometimes that doesn't happen i have to also say that in this same matter there's information that's now come to light that paints a completely different picture in terms of the opinion that i was at in that adjudication um, and indeed, you know, that would change my view going forward if I was to be instructed again. Um, so it just goes to show you, you, you never know all the information you might or might not have. Um, and you're very, very much reliant upon uh, being provided that information and obviously asking specific questions. Um, so that's uh, really, really good. Okay, so uh, moving on then to um, Helena White. Uh, Helena is going to talk to us about the benefits of experts in hearings and adjudications. And hopefully you've got some other war stories as well for us having this over time. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you, everyone else, for your um, uh, excellent informative talk so far. So I'm, I'm going to move things on slightly from where Rupa was um, to talk about uh, things at the dispute stage, so litigation and um, adjudication both. Um, as both Bill and Rupa outlined, experts are going to be required in litigation wherever the court isn't going to possess the technical knowledge to decide the issues in dispute without that specialist input. So um, it's either going to be that an expert is required um, because um, uh, to comment on liability or to comment on quantum. Um, so in litigation in particular, the court will absolutely require evidence on liability to be obtained uh, to support allegations of um, professional negligence raised against a construction uh, uh, professional. And you will need to provide that evidence from a professional of the same competency um, as the uh, uh, construction professional against whom you are bringing a claim. If you don't do that, there's um, a very real risk that your claim will be struck out. Um, the authority for it is the case of Pantelli, a judgment of Mr Justice Coulson, as he then was. In particular, he said that it is a matter of common sense. Um, how can it be uh, asserted that Act X was something that an ordinary professional would and should not have done if no professional in the same field had expressed such a view? So there he's basically talking about um, the inverse of what I'm sure we're all familiar as a, a the uh, Bolam test, which is um, that any act or omission of a professional won't be negligent if um, a, uh, a a cohort of um, your colleagues would support uh, the way that you acted. However, there are um, exceptions to the so what I've just described as the absolute um, requirement to get expert evidence to support. Uh, your allegations of breach in professional negligence claims and they are essentially areas where the alleged breach is so obviously wrong that there's no technical input required um, at all so essentially where the court can just use its common sense to see that something is um, wrong and um, the particular like painful example that I have come across in my practice is um, that an architect when submitting the, his ap application for uh, planning permission had submitted completely the wrong drawings with the planning application. So it basically showed with the planning application a house in completely the wrong um, um, orientation to that uh, which the um, employer wanted to build. So you can imagine halfway through a lot of noisy building works I, I sort of envisage it as the neighbour popping their head over the fence to say, um, excuse me, like, you've built this house the wrong way round? Um, yeah, so um, immediate enforcement action, they had to uh, take it down and rebuild it. And I think you won't be um, surprised to know that uh, that one settled uh, quite early. Um, however, as well as liability issues, expert evidence is very likely to be needed to assess quantum, because again, that's going to be um, a specialist area of knowledge outside the, uh, that that the court will have, and it might be that you you need what you you might call 
straight quantum um, evidence, so something from a QS um, to uh, value uh, works that have been carried out, but it also might be that you require valuation evidence if what you're alleging is a diminution in value by way of um, loss in any particular case. Um, so um, in litigation, it's going to be the case that even if what you're submitting to the court is a claim to assess a final account, so the true valuation of um, works carried out, you're always going to have to have um, expert evidence, Part 35 compliant um, evidence that has been talked about by Bill and uh, Rupa both. Um, however, if we're talking about adjudication, there isn't the same absolute requirement to provide expert evidence in, um, um, in um, any claim. Um, it, it's very, very common in my experience that um, if the dispute is, for example, over a relatively moderate value final um, account, then the referring party is simply going to submit by way of evidence the uh, final account um, that it's been using throughout the project and basically say this is the value that's been certified by the contract administrator under the building contract um, and so the adjudicator can rely on that. There may be dis disputes raised by the responding party but um, they may also be um, asking the adjudicator to essentially rely on their own experience and knowledge insofar as they are also a construction professional um, to decide the, the disputes that have been um, raised. Um, of course there are the same part 35 um, issues about making a declaration um, that you know your obligations are to the court um, in adjudication but it's very common that um, experts will put in a similar statement um, to demonstrate uh, that, well, basically their impartiality and their credibility and those things that, as Bill was explaining, they go to um, basically the reason that the adjudicator is going to accept their evidence over somebody else's. Um, it's very likely that in any event, no matter how big or small the claim, where what is in dispute is a professional negligence um, claim, so for example, a claim against an architect or structural engineer, that you're going to want to get your own expert evidence in any event to support um, your allegation of breach for the sorts of reasons that were set out by um, Mr. Justice Coulson in that Pantelli case. However, arguably, as I've hinted at, um, even in those sorts of professional negligence cases, there isn't the need for expert um, evidence. Um, however, I would say as a general, uh, and, and so what that means is that when you're selecting your adjudicator, you can take into account uh, whether that particular person has the right, as it were, competency to use their own knowledge and experience to um, decide the issues in the dispute without uh, the input of independent experts. Um, I think a general health warning uh, when it, you are approaching um, being willing to rely on um, a, an adjudicator without providing expert evidence is that um, if you don't provide your own expert evidence, you'll have lost the opportunity to really shape your case and uh, to make sure that you have the ability to argue back on any technical points that might come back from the um, other side. But it might be that in particular cases um, that would be appropriate. Um, it, it, looking at the, the scheme for construction contracts, which governs the powers that adjudicators have, um, it, it looks from paragraph 13 that, it, that there is scope for, and it was envisaged that adjudicators might be able to act in that sort of way. Um, paragraph 13 gives um, adjudicators the power to take the initiative in ascertaining the facts and the law necessary to, dis to determine the dispute and in particular they are allowed so long as they get necessary consent and permission from the parties to the dispute they can undertake site visits and inspections they can undertake tests and in experiments and they're also given the express 
right to appoint experts if they need. So it might be that um, you have a professional appointed, such as a structural engineer or an architect, who can deal with the liability points, but they wouldn't be able to deal with quantum points. And so it might be that they would ask to appoint a, uh, a um, QS in order to, to deal with that particular part of the claim. Um, oftentimes, regardless of what experts the parties have brought on their own account, um, adjudicators end up being criticised where they have brought their own knowledge and experience to bear on the decision that they render. However, it's been noted in the courts, so in the case of um, Farrelly ME Builder Services, Ramsey J said that, of course, um, that the fact that adjudicators have some knowledge and experience in a particular um, area is uh, precisely the reason uh, that they've been appointed in the first place. And you will all have noted in the recent Supreme Court case of Bresco, which deals with the ability of companies in, in insolvency to bring and enforce adjudications, that the Supreme Court was particularly um, impressed by the specialist knowledge that adjudicators may have and their ability to use that to determine construction disputes. Um, however, a trawl through the authorities where you have examples of the courts deciding both ways that, um, a, a, that it, it was both right and wrong in certain circumstances of an adjudicator to bring their own specialist knowledge to bear um, in any particular case. Um, the, the bottom line is that they m mustn't be found to have gone off on a uh, frolic of their own. So really that means that um, in so far as an, an adjudicator is going to use their own um, knowledge when um, uh, deciding a dispute, um, they've got to consult the parties about it uh, and they can't just sort of, well, in the example of the poor adjudicator in Balfour Beatty and uh, London Borough Lambeth, um, that was an example where an adjudicator used his own um, as-built programme to assess the critical path. Um, he didn't invite the parties to comment on it. He didn't even inform them that he was going to use it. Um, and so when it came to enforcement, the court was very happy to say that he'd, in that instance, breached natural justice. Um, but by way of another example, um, Mr Justice Aikenhead, in the case of Arcadis UK Limited in May, said that so long as the parties have had an opportunity to make comment on the um, the methodology or dis the decision making process that is going to be used by the adjudicator, then that's okay. In that particular instance, it was found that the adjudicator hadn't gone off on a, a frolic of his own just because he split the difference between the figures put forward by the referring and the responding parties. Um, so I think as to the, the the takeaway um, about when you're going to really need expert evidence, when it's going to be useful in litigation, you're really that's really de um, uh, uh, determined by the case of Pantelli and the law surrounding that. That's already dictated. You have a lot freer reign when you're using adjudication as your method of dispute resolution. It might be that in something very uh, small, so not very complicated and relatively low value, that um, it seems disproportionate to go and get your own expert evidence where you can rely on um, what you would hope would be a impartial view of the adjudicator in any event. But where you're starting to get to any sort of claim where there's complexity, especially any uh, professional negligence um, claim and anything where you're starting to get to a higher value then my advice would always be to get your own expert um, evidence and as people have said important to get it as early as possible it's obviously more difficult if you're the responding party to a semi-surprise um, adjudication um, but it, it will help you as I said formulate your case and also better respond to any arguments that come back to you by the other side or even questions from the um, adjudicator um, and is likely to give you a better outcome. Although who knows with adjudication, sometimes it can be slightly unexpected in its results. Um, so 
the last thing I just want to touch on is um, how uh, experts can be useful in litigation in particular. And it's a very short point about knowing, building on what Rupa said that you, you will, having worked with your expert for a long time, probably be able to rely on them to be their, an advocate for their own view. So very importantly, not an advocate for the party, but that um, you will essentially be able to um, uh, kind of trust them to go out and in many cases they're going to be having more of a, of a discussion with the judge directly especially if the judge has opted uh, for what people call hot tubbing so the both experts will be in the box at the same time the judge will direct um, the cross-examination um, uh, but with great power comes great responsibility and so it brings me to my most recent horrific war story of it's a, it's a case about um, surveyors negligence where throughout this rather tortured claim there was a big question about should the surveyor have used a building survey or was it all right that they used the home buyer survey that they did and we'd talked about it for weeks and weeks and weeks and we were a few days into the trial and the judge seemed to be making noises which made me think that he was pretty much like yeah yeah i think it should have been a building survey that's interesting let's let's talk more about that and my expert got into the box and a couple of questions in essentially unsolicited said that um it was the surveyor's uh, uh, choice as to whether they used the uh, building survey which essentially meant it wasn't negligent to use to use the home buyer survey um which just meant that that whole plank of our case um uh, evaporated right there and I, I, all I had to do was sort of do my best to keep my best poker face but the judge did look at me with a sort of a raised eyebrow of um, oh dear what are you going to do now um, <laughs> luckily it was all right we won on a different point but um, yeah I think yeah that was basically my um, takeaway from that would be uh, 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 please don't do that <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Helena. Thank you for giving the barrister's view and uh, sharing some of your stories. Um, I, I totally agree in terms of obviously experts need to understand uh, and, and be experienced in their own technical ability. And I think as well, experts need to understand um, the CPR changes and the rules and how they evolve. So, uh, so for example, on the 1st of October this year, update 122 comes into force. Um, which affects experts uh, following the uh, Liverpool Victoria Insurance Company case and Doctors of R 2019. And this was all regarding the uh, concerning a false statement of truth and the amendment of an opinion. Um, so, you know, as experts, we, we need to be, uh, you know, obviously understanding our own expertise and what our boundaries are, but also understanding, um, you know, what the CPR rules uh, are, are telling us to do and, and what parameters we need to work within. Um, so thank you for that. We are coming to the end of the uh, webinar. Uh, it's amazing where one hour goes to. Um, however, we have got just a few questions um, that hopefully we can just squeeze in, uh, if at all possible. So I'd like to thank the speakers uh, for taking the time out and, and delivering um, a, a great webinar. Thank you very much. Uh, just in terms of a couple of uh, questions then. Um, when working with experts uh, to prepare for cross-examination, where should the line between guidance and coaching be drawn, uh, which obviously is not allowed? Um, and I guess I'll, I'd like to put that one at the lawyers, really, because I think there's a, you know, there's, as, as, as experts, you know, I, I'd like to have a, a, a view, please. Yeah, so my view on that would be it's entirely permissible from the point of view of the lawyers, from the legal team, to want to push somebody in conference to make sure that the, the expert has explored their view because you're not asking them to necessarily be well to be applying a legal test particularly but um so um it seems to me that it's entirely open to you to kind of push as though you were going to be doing cross-examination to the same extent that i would say it's okay to um, perhaps draft proposed amendments in a uh, report, although you've got to always know as the baseline 
that the report is the expert's report and you're not going to be helping anyone, not going to be helping the expert or your client if the expert saying to you, I, I, I don't really think I could um, hold on to that opinion um, uh, if uh, cross-examined or um, if pushed on it and they're going to have to give it up. Uh, which I might say was not what happened in the case I was just talking about. But um, yeah, so so I think it's fine to have a relatively robust discussion about it and make suggestions, but you just have to know that if the expert says no, that's not their view, then then that's where that ends. Okay, thank you very much. Rupert, do you have anything to add to that? It's just to say that actually part of that, if you call, if it's called guidance or I mean, part of the remit is for us to test the arguments. So that is that, you know, as Helen's mentioned, we've got to question it, we've got to challenge it. Um, and that's, if we didn't do that, that we wouldn't be doing our jobs properly. But I guess, yes, it's knowing what the limit of that is and saying, ultimately, if that's not going to, if that's not going to fly with the expert, you, you just can't enforce your view upon them. It, it, and you wouldn't want to, because ultimately, it wouldn't stack up and actually you'd be undone right at the crucial minute. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, one, uh, Bill, uh, one for you, I think, uh, in terms of some experts, um, we know have got into trouble recently over the issue of conflicts of interest. Um, where should borders be defined? And are these the same legally and commercially or ethically? So what view do you have on that, please, Bill? You're, you're mute, Bill. Bill, you on mute. Sorry about that. That's a big question. Uh, thank you for asking that. Um, th this, for me, turns on the difference between a fiduciary duty um, to a client or the independence of the expert and the overriding duty to the court. And do those two obligations clash? Um, a fiduciary duty arrives un arises under common law. Um, so it's not necessarily written into the expert's appointment. Um, so say, for example, um, A will act for B uh, in circumstances which give rise to a relationship of trust and confidence, that would be a fiduciary duty. And it's generally thought um, that an expert didn't have a fiduciary duty to his client um, because that might clash with his independence. However, there's recently been a case in arbitration, and it's known as A versus XYZ, primarily because it's in arbitration, the party's names can't be disclosed. But there was, in this situation, there was a global expert witness provider who provided a delay expert to one of the parties and a quantum expert to the opposing party. It's not quite as black and white as that, it's a bit more complicated. One was actually a third party and could have been a third party to a second dispute. But the principle is exactly the same, that what happens when a large expert witness provider provides two experts to two opposing sides? So one of the parties applied to the TCC for an injunction to prevent this from happening. Um, so and what happened was the, the defense from the, the um, large global expert provider was that the, the two experts were in different disciplines. One was delay, one was quantum. Um, there was a physical barrier between them in that uh, they both worked actually for two separate companies within the group of companies. Um, and they were in two different regions in the world. One was based in Asia and one was based in uh, Europe, I think. And there was also an electronic barrier because both separate businesses worked off separate servers. So there was no direct connection between the two. However, what's important is the profits from the two businesses eventually distilled up to the parent company. Um, and the consequence was that the TCC granted the injunction. So the TCC decided that an expert provider does owe a fiduciary duty to its client. Now, there's been quite a lot written about this recently and there's been no appeal in the, in the courts. So this may, this may change. Um, who knows? Let's, let's, let's keep watching this, but it's very recent. So if I go back to the question that you asked and, and try and pick up the four limbs, um, where are the borders defined? Well, I think the borders are defined where the fiduciary obligation rests. And from a legal perspective, this is 
really one for the lawyers and not for myself, but I think I think it was been set by the case of A versus XYZ for the time being. Um, where Mrs. Justice O'Farrell and the TCC clarified that a fiduciary may put themselves in a may not put themselves in a position where their duty and their interest may conflict. Um, however, we mustn't forget the fact that clients can accept a potential conflict. So the two parties in this case could have accepted that the two experts came from um, the same stable, if you like. Um, and I think Helena and Rupert might want to add something to this when I've when I finished. Um, and also, as I've mentioned, there has been no appeal yet. It's early days, and, and, and I think most people are expecting there may be an appeal to this judgment. Um, so the third limb of the question, I think, was commercially. Uh, well, I think it's all down to structure, because one of the arguments that there's no difference between an expert and a barrister from this technical point of view in the barrister's chamber quite often supplies two barristers on the same case representing op opposing sides. And therefore, why can't um, an expert witness provider provide two experts to work for opposing sides? Well, the distinction there is the structure of the, of the corporations in turn, and, and by that I mean that the barrister's chambers um, doesn't benefit from the work that the barrister does. So in effect, it, it's commonly known that barristers are effectively self-employed and pay fees into the chambers. Whereas an employee of a company, um, the output, outturn of the case would influence the profits of that organization. So it comes down to the, the structure of the businesses providing the services. That covers commercially. I think the last limb was ethically. Well, for me, ethically, I don't think there's an issue. I think, I think the two experts would work independently, and I do believe that they would have worked the hardest and pro produced independent reports. However, there's always, and I go back to the talk that I gave earlier, the perception of bias. And where there's the perception of bias, it really weakens the work of the expert. You have to consider how much weight would a tribunal give the expert evidence where there is a perception of bias. And so I think that answers the four limbs of the question, Paul. Thank you very much, Bill, for that comprehensive response. Uh, Helena, Rupert, do you want to just come back on the legal aspects of that in terms of the, the, and it, you know, the, the XY case and then any views you might have on that? Yeah, I mean, I, so, I think one one issue that um, you're uh, talking about, Bill, is about sort of the, the difference between um, Chambers and the firm where the two experts meet. And I, I just wanted to add the fact that uh, one thing that Chambers can be quite good at is separating the information coming into Chambers. So putting up what people call um, Chinese walls, so you don't have any um, um, sort of um, information um, going between uh, the, the barristers or even the people clerking the barristers and, and it just seems to me that I think that this is probably partly commercial part, partly ethical but if if it's possible for the firm where the experts are working to keep that same sort of really clear line that um, clear delineation then that would be another reason to say that actually there can be no reason why to independent experts who have those very particular obligations of impartiality and um, that their main um, objective is to, to, um, to the court, then it doesn't seem to me that there should really be any reason why you can't come from the same firm. I think this is why I'm, most people are expecting there to be uh, an appeal to this decision. Yeah. I mean, in the, in the case of XY, the two experts worked for two different businesses. Uh, they were owned by the same parent company, but they worked for two different businesses in two different geographical regions of the world. Um, so, you know. There's so a not really much connection at all. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank, thank you very much. Um, just uh, just a one final question um, which has come in, which is uh, what advice and guidance can you give for experts given evidence remotely? Uh, so in these current times of COVID-19, um, has anybody got any views on that on the panel, please? 
So I think the big tip for any virtual hearings is to make sure you've got all the papers, basically. I know that sounds like such a silly thing, but it can be really destabilizing if you're asked a question and you, you're trying to make reference to a document and you don't have it to hand. So it's those sorts of things that can put you at ease so you can just perform as you know you can. I'm sure when being questioned, you will have really thought about your opinion. You will have anticipated questions and you don't want to be knocked off that by not having the papers there. And also, I suppose, just to have a bit of a practice of speaking in this slightly odd virtual environment where normally you'd be looking right at the judge and you'd be be able to sort of read body language and get that sort of communication in the room which of course you can't really have um in the virtual setup but yeah just to just to make sure as a matter of kind of practicality you're all set up just as you wish so that you can feel as comfortable as possible when the nasty questions come from the nasty barristers um so that you feel comfortable Excellent. Thank you, Helena. Uh, Rupa or Bill, do you have any, uh, anything to add to that at all? I mean, the only, I've actually found surprisingly it's been very effective working remotely. I think um, the only thing I would say where you are at a disadvantage is, again, it's the availability of papers. So when you're early on in a case, the benefit of being in a meeting room together where you can all look at a drawing and understand exactly what's going on or look at a programme, I think I'd be quite keen to get back to that. Um, but all things considered, it's been very effective working remotely. And I think the benefits of technology have assisted in that regard. But um, I still quite like to have, because again, it is a collaborative thing. So getting that dynamic right, I don't think anything quite replaces that um, in the same way as working together in the meeting room. So I'm quite traditional in that regard. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Um, just to add to that, I, I know that the, uh, the Academy of Experts um, published on the 2nd of September um, Remote and Virtual Hearings Guidance for Experts. That is a useful document uh, for those experts that uh, might be embarking upon um, hearings remotely. I, I would I'd suggest you have a good read of that. Okay. Uh, it brings us to the end of our session. We have run over by 12 minutes currently, so uh, thank you for sticking with us. I hope you found the event and the webinar useful. I must um, thank the speakers um, for giving up their time uh, and also for preparing for today's session. Uh, so thank you, Rupa, Helena, uh, Andrew and Bill. Uh, you know, these are done in a, in a matter of five minutes, these sessions. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Annie and uh, Stuart from Limeslade for helping us facilitate today's session. And that's about it. So thank you very much in all, in all indeed. This uh, presentation will be online for those that want to receive it and, and might have had difficulties joining today. Uh, and uh, just pleasure to say thank you once more. Have a pleasant day and see you soon. Bye-bye for now. Thank you. Bye-bye.